Foxes Don't Ask Questions by Vingel W. Sergeant First Class Joseph Till felt his eyes water against the wind's caressing breath. Even so, he retained his gaze into the late afternoon sky. The colours resembling a vulgar canvas, as if some poor bastard had been blown clear open and some sick fuck had decided to throw his guts into the sky for display. The clouds around seemed to soak the colours into their grey forms like a sponge. Below the black helicopter extended the face of Kenya, showcasing warped patterns of jungles and dry fields like a shabby quilt. This blasted country had managed to do in a week what usually took months in others, become a bane of Till's existence. Afghanistan, Kuwait, and even the clusterfuck of Iraq had nothing on the jungles of African soil. It was a cocktail of shit piled in one, starting with the thickest brush that would make even the most hardcore explorer second-guess their passion, tossed in with a barrage of bugs that could turn skin into bubble wrap under a minute, all blended up with the heat, feeling as if the land itself sat in between the crack of the devil's ass. How life even managed it was a surprise in itself. Some people call it proof of humanity's ability to adapt and live against all odds, no. Stubbornness felt more fitting. The unwillingness to finally throw in the fucking towel and die off already. Fuck it, Till thought. Regardless of how he felt, he had no say in the matter. None did whoever was stupid enough to sign the dotted line for the cause. Nothing like signing away your soul. SFC Till was in charge of an ops extraction team made up of five men including himself. One of his men even coined the name Fox Tango, which reluctantly became an unofficial one even the higher-ups began to use. Why was still a mystery in itself. They were good at what they did. Hell, they were the best, an elite squad of highly skilled soldiers who did what needed to be done without the questions. There were no annoying inquiries opposing higher command, no second-guessing gestures, Nothing except the faultless mindset essential for the well-rounded soldier. The brass loved that about them. No one liked to know sniffing the wrong area unless it was coated with a brown tip. They did their job, and in turn, it kept the missions coming and the money with it. Their new assignment involved a rescue, so to speak. Apparently, one of Uncle Sam's choppers was recently shot down by enemy Somalian forces. Somalia was a cesspool of instability, even after the intervention of the United Nations in their little squabble of a civil war years ago. It was never a good idea to break up two dogs going at it. Not if you didn't expect to get bit yourself, at least. The past few months brought up a new faction of Somalian extremists, who began an uprise against their government. Intel relayed that the cowards took their assaults onto the general populace. In defense, the government deployed their military force to intervene, but their efforts fell short against them. Word through the vine spread that an unknown benefactor was funding the extremists, bringing in powerful weapons never before seen in the black market. These weapons were a game changer and they managed to catch the interest of Old Sam. In response, a team was sent to extract a few of those weapons, but their airship was targeted. Right from the get-go, Sam fucked up when he didn't send in Fox Tango instead. If you're going to do something, do it right the first time. The chopper was shot down before crossing into Kenya, ultimately crashing deep within its jungles. It was able to send out a distress signal moments before the crash. Since then, communication with the crew could not be re-established. Based off the last known coordinates, Till's team was being sent in to do what they did best, and what they should have been doing from the very beginning. Just another simple extraction. Right? Hey, sir, GTA in five minutes! A voice yelled out against the wind's howl. The voice started Till, reeling him back from the depths of his thoughts. His watery eyes felt relief upon pulling them from the airstream. They fell upon the would-be owner of the voice, with squinting eyes, Staff Sergeant Snow peered back into Till's. 
Half of Snow's face radiated from the device in his hand. In the green glow, Till could still see the thin scar extending across his face. It etched from his temple down to the edge of the jawbone like a vandalized car. It served as a visual reminder, a mark received when Snow saved his ass back in Afghanistan. Had Snow not intervened, the blade of that Taliban would have done more than engrave him like the scorn of a pissed-off girlfriend. Snow was his backup when he needed it. He was the voice of reason and a brother if there ever was one. Too bad he was too stupid to get married. HQ says to expect a possible delay on the extraction bird. SSG Snow continued, yelling in combat against the wind. What the hell for? Till asked, annoyed at the update. They said they're short on birds. Three in maintenance and the other two were sharing with 75th. Till sighed in discontent. Aren't we here to clean up 75th shit in the first place? And yet they still can't even fucking guarantee a bird. I'm afraid so, Joe. That's great. No fucking surprise. After a quick glance at his watch, Till gave a gesture towards Snow. Snow understood it. All right, everyone, look alive. We'll be hitting the drop zone in about three mics. At his command, the other occupants of the cabin began to move. Helmet straps were tightened and magazine cartridges loaded. Immediately sitting across from Snow was SSG Tinsley. His hulking figure counteracted to the calm scrutiny in his eyes. The giant quietly double-checked his ammo packs before returning his gaze off into the sky. His weapon sat across his lap an M240B, a rather sizable machine gun believable for the hands of a giant. Yet in Tinsley's, the massive weapon's appearance was more trivial. Tinsley was a man of few words, but was one tough son of a bitch in the eyes of Till. He was nicknamed GL because the John Stewart Green Lantern was his favorite superhero. Ironically, he seemed to share the same attitude of the character. Next to him was Sergeant Ryder, nicknamed Gerber for his young, baby-like face. Facial hair was not in the kid's future, at least not for a while, despite his innocent appearance. He was a sharp kid, very intuitive and calculating, almost like a younger version of Till. Ryder was aggressively jotting into a notebook, pausing only to adjust the strap of his weapon. Leaning outside opposite of Till was none other than Sergeant Jones the wisecracker of the team. Jones was a fucking idiot, but he was one hell of a marksman as well. His cocky demeanor in sniper school involved insulting his instructors or pulling childish pranks at remarkable distances, resulting in his eventual dismissal. However, his talents granted him a spot on Fox Tango and the nickname Crackshot. If not for that, he would have had the shortest career. The idiot quickly hucked a wad of phlegm into the wind, watching it concede to gravity. If there ever was a wonder for the nicknames, he was it. Somehow, Jones became the unofficial creator of them, believing everything needed one. Despite the annoyance of them, the names managed to stick. Except for Till. The last time Jones tried to honor Till with one, he gladly bestowed a strong nut shot to shut him up. The only names Till wanted to hear for himself were Sergeant, SFC Till, or Best Sarge. Hey, Big Sarge! Jones called out. Asshole, Till thought, biting his lip. He already knew Jones had a smart comment. He glanced over to meet his goofy, half-cocked smile. Word of mouth says you join the club for forties, he said, tossing a thumbs up. Is that what's going round? Till replied glancing over to meet the guilty smile of Snow. So, I was wondering what you had in mind, Jones continued. What's Big Sarge gonna do on a special day? The question seemed to draw the attention of everyone else. Even Tinsley withdrew his mind from the clouds. Don't know. Might just spend the night with a bottle of Jack, he replied reluctantly. Jones issued a groan of disappointment. Surprisingly, everyone else complied with the same notion. Come on, Big Sarge, you can do better than that. Look, hear me out, he said, leaning in close for everyone to hear. We all got leave coming up after this mission. I say we do it big and hit a great spot up in Brazil. It's called Moi Loco Calientes. They got the best drinks, and most importantly, 
they got the best female strippers. Nope. Forget it. Till quickly shot back. I'm not hitting up a titty bar for my birthday. Most importantly, I'm not going to end ones associated with you. Everyone groaned in discontent. Come on, Sarge. Tinsley interjected. I can't lie, that doesn't sound like a bad move. You gotta do something fun for your birthday. You're only 40 once, and in our line of work, that means a lot. Several other agreements followed around. Till's gaze slowly went around the cabin, peering into all the eyes trained on him. I'm game, Ryder replied when he met his. Jones was nodding, still housing that goofy smile on his face. Till felt a hand on his shoulder from Snow, who issued a nod as well. After another minute, he gave a long sigh. Fine, he conceded, but under one condition. In praise, everyone passed out high fives and fist pounds. The cabin gave a minor shake when the helicopter halted in the air, hovering above the ground. I want to hear less shit from your mouth today, Jones. Got it? The Black Hawk slowly made its descent onto the ground. From there, the men quickly hopped out forming a perimeter around the bird in the dirt clearing. A hurricane of dry earth was thrown into the air by the propellers, creating a thick wall of dust. Immediately after vacating, the bird took off into the air again. The steady tempo of its blades released a cadence echoing like an audience applauding in sync. Eventually, though, the clapping noise faded, leaving the men to the calm sounds of the jungle around. Calms, chick. This is Teal. I'll copy. Till said, adjusting the small intercom piece in his right ear. This is Gerber. That's clean copy. GL here. That's a good copy as well. Crack shot. I'm good and ready, ladies. Taskmaster responding. That's a green on all comms, Fox Lima. Copy that. Intel reports possible enemy traffic in the area. So let's keep the chit chat to a minimum. Target estimated at 15 miles due east. ENT is at 900. So make sure we move with a purpose. Eagle Eye, this is Fox Lima. Times have set. I repeat, times are set. How copy? It took a second before a deep voice distorted by a static answer. That's a clean copy, Fox Lima. You're agreeing to go. Till looked over to Snow and quickly flashed three fingers, followed by two. Shadow nodded and spoke over the intercom. Okay, GL, take point. Gerber, wedge it off to my right. Jones, you got six. Brush is deep, so I want heads on a swivel. The team came together, forming a makeshift triangle, fencing the jungle tree line. Even now in the late afternoon, lingering like the last guest who couldn't take the hint at the end of the house party. It didn't help either that every cloud seemed to avoid the flaming ball of misery like the plague. Before them stood the boundless city of trees, acting as conveyors to their world. Their splintering wooden bodies appeared dry and ragged, Many of them had bark peeling in layers like molting skin. Tim gave a quick notion, signaling the team to move forward into the thick bush. The bushes and branches mocked their attempts to move with subtlety, announcing every notion of movement with a snap and a harsh sway. The teams pressed onward though, enduring a lengthy trudge through the vegetation slowly eating away at the time. Two hours in, they grew close to the edge of the jungle, Tinsley quickly threw up his fist, signaling for the team to halt. Immediately, everyone froze, raising their weapons and assuming a position. What do you see, Gio? Till asked, leaning up against a tree. We got two Sierras ahead, facing away, both armed with light weapons. AKs. Can you confirm they're extremists? There was a slight pause before he heard an answer. Yeah, is them all right? And Sarge. Before he could finish, several men sprang from the bush, each holding an AK-47 and yelling in Somalian tongue. The numbers seemed to be around seven, maybe more, all surrounding Till and his men. The Somalians' hollers seemed to elevate, probably for them to throw down their weapons, yet Till had not given such an order. His team had their weapons up, each trained on a target before ready to fire if commanded. Finally, Till spoke up softly. All right, Ryder. You're up. At his command, Ryder let his weapon hang to his side. With his hands up in a surrendering pose, he began to speak out, matching the Somalian men in language. 
A few of the men exchanged confused looks at each other, no doubt surprised they had a translator among them. Till had no idea what Ryder was saying, but they always had the same strategy for dealing with these types of situations. Ryder was fluent in several languages and always crafty with his words. He was a cunning bastard, again reminding him of himself, minus the linguistic skills. The plan was always to get their assailants to call forth their leader. If Ryder felt like the conversation was going well, he would put up his hands firm in the air. However, if he felt he was heading south, he would twitch his hands. It would be subtle to the untrained eye, but to the team it meant open fire. Ryder's hands remained firm for now. He continued to converse with the men, making slow advances to them. At every word he issued, the men would return in an angry response. The skinny bunch of Somalian men appeared like nothing more than average townsfolk, men who probably picked up a gun not long ago. Each of them had a chain link of ammunition across their chest, reflecting faces like cheap action figures. They wore a red bandana, either on their heads or on their arms, a symbol most likely to their organization. Till had his weapon trained on the big one, arguing with Ryder. His face held a twisted snarl with his eyes glaring like a bull. His weapon was pointed a mere foot away from the face of Ryder. Inside, Till craved the brute to give him an excuse to drop him, but Ryder had not relayed a signal. Finally, after another minute of argument, the big guy called back to the others. Till could see the brush dancing and flailing from someone approaching. Emerging from it was a young man appearing no older than Ryder. With a confident stride, he made his way up to the big Somalian still holding Ryder at gunpoint. Immediately, he began talking to the man as if irritated at the request he'd been summoned. He seemed to badger the big guy until abruptly holding up his hand to gesture silence. He glared quietly at Ryder before speaking out in a strong accent. Who the hell is in charge of this pack? I know it is not this little mouse before me. You'll want to talk, Till thought. He walked up slowly, lowering his weapon, keeping it tight in his hands. I am SFC Till. I take you're the man in charge. Several of the team took a glance back at the situation, but kept their weapons trained on the men around them. I'm Oda, leader of the Twisted Bantu. This is my land. Tell me why you American pigs are in my jungles, and why I shouldn't slaughter you like such. We're simply passing through. To go to where? Why are you here? Sad scene. Till mocked. Heard the canyon jungle was a hell of a spot to tour. I had to see it for myself. The man's face was solid like a statue before issuing a false laugh. Afterwards, he took out a pistol from his side, aiming at. Till immediately complied with his own weapon. The notion sparked a domino effect, forcing some of the Somalians to aim their weapons at Till. In turn, Tinsley adjusted his angle for a few of those men. Snow's weapon, however, remained in place. Do you think it wise to mock the leader of the Twisted Bantu? My men could slaughter all of you here and now. Is that so? Without warning, a red dot appeared on the man's left shoulder. It flashed a few times in his eyes before settling back over his heart. He glanced down at the dot. Just give me the word, Big Sarge. Hold that shot, Jones. These extremists thought they had Till's team ambushed, but Jones always kept a sharp eye out. It was not unlike him to purposely linger behind to post up. His signal had always been three blank receivers over the comms, a sharp beeping noise from turning the comms on and off. If they all heard that sound, they knew to be on high alert. So, older, was it? I suggest you tell your men to stand down. Unless, of course, the Bantu have other assholes lined up to take your place. In any case, we'll be more than happy to send them your way as well. Hesitation was not a factor for Tinsley and Snow when it came to a firefight. It would only take seconds for them to mow down the targets near them. As for Till, he had a choice between dropping the big guy and denying Jones a pleasurable shot on the self-pronounced leader. The man flared his nostrils, glaring intensely back. Eventually, he gestured for his men to lower their weapons. So now what, Sergeant? Are you going to slaughter me and my men? Why not, Joe? Serves these civilian killing bastards right. 
This didn't seem to sit right with the man. His eyes ensnared with anger, more than before. Who has told you this? We are the Twisted Bantu, the fighters of the people against the government. Bullshit, you're the scum killing people. You expect us to believe the government's attacking their own? Yes! Those spineless cowards began taking our women and children, doing God knows what to them. When the people began speaking out against it, they claimed we were trying to overthrow them and began firing on us. I witnessed a group of their soldiers opening fire on a group of unarmed protesters. After that, we knew what we had to do. We formed the Twisted Bantu to protect ourselves. Sarge? Till was quiet for a minute, before lowering his weapon. Stand down, everyone. Tinsley immediately complied, lowering his. Snow was hesitant at first, but eventually conceded as well. The red dot faded from Odo's shirt. Odor, you said the government was the one attacking the populace, Till repeated. Yes, I give you my word. You've crossed paths with them in a firefight? Odo gave a confused expression as if his pride was on the line. Of course, I've killed thirteen of those cowards. In these fights, have you ever come across any powerful weaponry you couldn't handle? Otto's eyes flashed with the utmost amount of subtlety, but Till caught it. I am not sure what you mean. I know nothing of what you say. Till exchanged a glance over to Snow, who returned a soft shake in disapproval. It was clear he was aware of Till's intentions. However, they were running low on time and daylight. About three hours ago, a chopper went down from Somalian extreme... Somalian soldiers. You tracking the whereabouts of that? Odo took a minute to converse with the large man in Somalian tongue. Till, in turn, exchanged a glance with Ryder, who nodded. After conversing, Odo returned to English. My men did see a craft. American, no doubt? Yeah. So that is why you are here. Your chopper should still be there. Assuming the government filth hasn't reached them fast. You need to find this craft, yes? No. We know how to find them. We just need to know if any government soldiers are posted up along the way. Oda shook his head. No, no. It is easier to show you. It would be too difficult to explain Kenyan lands to those unfamiliar with her. I can show you. Take you there. No. This is an American operation. Really, Sergeant? Well, I cannot guarantee where the soldiers come are posted then. I'm sure you're in short time. Till glared at Oda as a thin smile grew on the man's lips. What do you get out of this? The smile grew wider. Oh, I simply wish to help my new American friends. So now we're friends? Yes, why not? How does it go? The enemy of my enemy is my friend? It'd be a nice trade-off for these powerful weapons, wouldn't you say? I thought you weren't aware of these weapons. Odo simply extended his smile. This is a chance to help each other out. The choice is yours, Sergeant. I don't know, Sarge. Do you really want to trust these fools? Snow? Till questioned with a look towards his way. Snow was silent for a minute before responding. It's your call, Joe. Till gave a long sigh. Jones, make your way back. On it, big Sarge. See you in two. He glanced up at the smiling Odo. Take us there. It was clear to Till that Odo knew more than he was betraying to him. More so, he was not completely sold on the idea that the Somalian government was the one attacking the civilian population. Sure, it could be true as well. But in the event that it was not, Till was going by another saying. Keep your enemies closer. Odo led them out of the congestion of trees and into a bare field. The field was vast. Spotting arid soil, sprouting dry brushes among the open area like a balding man. They soon came upon a village thriving with people. There were children playing with a poorly inflated ball. Women carrying baskets of supplies, while some elderly folk simply sat around lazily. The village itself was mainly made up of shacks of wood heavily consolidated onto the area. The mass collection of shacks reminded Till of the cities of Iraq. 
and from one clusterfuck to enter another, he thought. A few of their feeble frames held their thin clothes acting as curtains or even makeshift doors. Like poorly constructed webs, clotheslines stretched from shacks decorated with an assortment of garments. A few chickens annoyingly scurried in between the heels of passing people, picking at treats seen only by their eyes. It is because of us, villagers such as these can live their days in peace, Oda brought up suddenly. We provide them with protection and food. And what do you get in return? Oda smirked. We ask for nothing in return. Except quarter for my men if we need it, and information on the government cowards. Seems like a fair trade-off. Almost too fair. What are you saying? That my men and I have ulterior motives? One of the trailing Somalians threw a mean glare towards Snow. Till shot one as well. We are here for the people? We are the people. We understand that. Do you? Yes. We know you have the people in mind. That's also why you want to get hold of those powerful weapons as well, right? Oda returned his twisted face of confusion. I told you I do not know of what you speak. Cut the shit, your eyes gave you away twice already. Till retorted, getting impatient. Oda scoffed. Tinsley and Ryder kept a close eye on the Somalian men who grew tighter in pace to Till. Johns remained in the rear with his own pair of escorts. Fine. We have seen these weapons, so what? I want the weapons to protect these people. Is that too much to ask? I suppose not. But before I guarantee anything, I want to know everything. About the weapons, about what's happening to these people, the government, everything. After another salty glare, the man eventually complied. About seven months ago, a young Somalian woman was walking home after fetching water from the river. The water was for her family, two sons and her sick mother. However, she never made it home that evening, when several villagers attempted to find her. His words began to trail off. Did they? Till inquired. Unfortunately, they did. Not without discovering a horrifying truth. They found the woman lifeless and stripped of her clothing. She had been defiled. Her breaths had been cut off, her hair shaven, and stab wounds were all over her body. When asked around, nobody saw what happened to her. That's sick, Ryder stated, overhearing. Sick? That is only half of it. The same thing began to happen to more people, even small children. The people attacked. Any chance there was a family or a friend connection between them? It's possible someone had a grudge. That is the crazy thing. This happened to random people, sometimes villages miles away from each other. Like I said before, we tried to take the police to the government to help us solve what was going on. What did they do? They ignored us. After several more days, we stood out in front of the president's office hoping he would hear us. What was his reaction? He had his soldiers line up in front of his office as if we were terrorists or something. Then one day, they opened fire, killing seven unarmed people. After that day, we swore to them that we would protect ourselves with or without their help. They took that as an act of rebellion, stating they would wipe out any who brought forward the same fruitless accusations. On that day, they declared war on us. We understood this was the only true way for our voices to be heard. And you've been fighting ever since then? Yes. Us bastards have the nerve to say we're attacking our own people, calling us cowards when they attack unfairly. How so? Odor was silent. Odor, you asked me to believe your side, but you won't give me all the facts. I need to know the whole story. What have you seen? After another minute of silence, he answered. I've never seen anything like it. They began to use strange weapons with enough power to blow a hole in a man the size of a guava fruit. It is no bigger than our own weapons here. When fired though, lightning flashes as if the wrath of Allah himself 
filling the air with the stench of hot kun mudka. I do not know where these weapons are from, but they are unstoppable. Because of them, we were pushed back out of Somalia to Kenya. Tillsborough frowned. Skepticism filled his eyes. Lightning? Are you sure that's what you saw? Yes, of course. Do you think I am lying? Well, it does sound a little far-fetched. It at least explains why you're in Kenya. Is that everything? No. One of my men reported seeing something. He claimed there were bright lights in the sky during a shootout. He said the lights came down and literally reached out and snatched up our men, as if it were alive. Tell them, Abazame, he said, gesturing to the big guy from earlier. The man's earlier scowl was absent. Instead, a face resembling a feeble child was before them. He spoke with an accent even stronger than Odo's. It is true. They were there in one moment and gone in another. I only got away because... I fled. He lowered his head in shame. Till was silent, unable to come up with a response. I don't know, Sarge. You buying all this bullshit? Yeah, come on, Sarge. GL is right. Sounds like some bullshit to me as well. The dude just probably bought her from getting taxed by these weapons and doesn't want to admit he's being outmatched by real soldiers. Instead, he wants to spit up an African ghost story about some living light. What the fuck? Then he wants us to feel sorry for him, too. Don't get me wrong, it is sad, but that's the fucking life. It doesn't mean we hand over whatever weapons we find to a bunch of pissed off villagers. Today's friend could be tomorrow's enemy. Till could not believe Jones was actually saying something worthwhile. Even so, what if the things Oda said were true? Oda came to a halt. I know this may be hard for you to believe, but it is the truth. I swear. I need to know if I can rely on your word. You promise that we can have these weapons and I will safely guide you to your aircraft. Know that I am not lying. There are many soldiers posted in the area, heavily armed with these weapons. The same soldiers that shot down your aircraft because they do not want your country to know. They are the enemies, not us. If you run into them, they will surely gun you down no matter how skilled you think you may be. We are your only hope. Till exchanged a glance from Odo to Snow. Go, Odo said. Talk it among your men. I will wait. He gestured for his men to pull away, leaving Till to his thoughts. Till made his way to Snow, signaling to the others to keep watch. For a minute, Till remained silent. He felt his mouth open to speak, but Snow spoke first. Remember that one mission back in Afghanistan? It was a simple intel gathering mission, reconning the nearby village. It was you, me, Casey, Shepard, and Garcia. We spent the entire day out until we got to a village, and not a single soul was willing to tell us anything, too afraid to speak. That is the last thing any of us wanted to hear. We were all exhausted and pissed off, you especially. Till was unsure why Snow was bringing this up, but he remained silent and listened. And then out of nowhere we got hit by an on-passing convoy of Taliban. They had us pinned down in the firefight, you took cover behind a house with a mother and her eight-day-old daughter. In the midst of all the bullets firing, that mother was hit, and the daughter was unscathed. I remember what you told me. You said, as the mother was dying, your eyes both met. It was brief, but a powerful moment. Her wounds didn't allow her to speak. Yet, through that simple encounter, you were able to understand what she desired. You could read it. She wanted you to take her daughter, to get her safety. Despite everyone's better judgment, even my own, you took the girl with you. After a long, strenuous fight, and by the grace of God, we managed to kill every last one of those bastards. After it was all clear, there it was. It was you and that girl. The other villagers either fled from the scene or shot in crossfire. 
She was a quiet one, but somehow even she knew and simply remained by our side. You gave her water, hell, even bits of your MRE when she was hungry. You even carried her when she couldn't walk anymore until we finally returned to the refugee camp. And as if the story wasn't strange enough, you were able to reunite her with her father. By some miracle, he was already there trying to make future arrangements for his family. My point, Joe, is that despite what others think, you've had your moments. All from what I've seen, you seem to always know the right choice. Your gut instinct has saved you fine until now. We've been through hell and back together. I've never abandoned you during any of your decisions, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. I'm here with you to the end. Let's just try and keep the good looks intact this time, though. Till was only able to cough up a light chuckle. He felt a few tears in his eyes, but immediately choked them back. He gave Snow a simple nod, placing his hand firm on his shoulder. What's it gonna be, Sarge? I can't lie. Taskmaster has me tearing up a little bit over here, and I'm catching mostly static. The smile grew wider on Till's lips as he shook his head at the comment. Everyone bring it in. We need to make sure Mr. Odor is on the same page as us. Snow smiled back, rendering a nod of approval. There are several enemy encampments here, here, and here, Odor noted on the map. The crumpled paper radiated under the red lens flashlight. The map was barely holding together, appearing like a used napkin, salvaged from a trash bin. The cruel heat was now gone along with the sun, in its place the kiss of coolness that caressed the skin. Under the cover of night, we should be able to move undetectable, Odo stated. We've got five miles to cover and a lot of enemy traffic, so night vision goggles on and keep noise to a minimum. Odo, have your men remain in the rear since none of you will be able to see. I will only bring one of my men, a Basame, Odo replied, gesturing to the big Somalian from earlier. The less movement from us, the better. Sounds good. Ryder, when we get closer, I want you to try and establish radio contact with Sierra 5 team. Tracking, Sergeant. I don't want to sound pessimistic, Sarge, but it's been four hours since the crash and we ain't heard a word from Sierra. And, Till replied. Regardless of what we think we'll find out there, we have a mission to complete. You're the last person I think would back out now. I'm not backing out, Sarge. Okay then, let's move out. We got brethren out there waiting for us. From there the team made their way out. With Oda's guidance, they hugged the tree line of the jungles, only entering when applicable. They passed by several areas containing soldier encampment, Spotlights from the roadblocks scanned the perimeter about like a prison tower. When they were about a mile out from the area of the crash site, Ryder attempted to make radio contact. Sierra 5, this is Fox Tango. I repeat, this is Fox Tango. How copy? The radio only returned an eerie streak of static. Ryder attempted to call again with more firmness, but the same result was received. Regardless, they pressed forward entering the tree line. Through their goggles, they kept a sharp eye out for any movement. After a seemingly endless track, a faint light began to appear ahead of them. The light was flickering poorly like a weak pulse. Sorry, I got eyes on the crash site. Copy that. Approach with caution. Maintain concealment until we're all in line. Tracking. What is it? We might be coming up on the crash site. The men pushed forward until they came upon the supposed site. Crouching in the trees, their eyes glanced ahead. Before then, they saw a vast clearing of trees from the aftermath of a helicopter crash. Several trees lay crushed or toppled with a large gaping hole revealing the initial entry point. The bird itself was like a metal carcass, lying in a twisted heap split in three pieces. The cockpit nose was buried deep into the ground where it managed to press a large amount of dirt up against the front windows. The second piece, the cabin, was split from the cockpit, but sat flat directly behind it. The tail had snapped off completely. The remnants of the rotor hung by a thread. The edges appeared charred from where it received fire. 
Small fires kindled around the site, providing minimal lighting to the carnage. Several metal cases lay spilled from the helicopter like the torn innards of a feeble prey. Good lord, Jones managed to say. It was the closest thing anyone had to say at this point. I got no eyes on the crew. There's zero movement, Snow brought up. Eagle Eye, this is Fox Lima. We've reached the objective. No visual on Sierra team yet. How copy? The same deep voice spoke behind the static. Copy that, Fox Lima. Proceed with caution. Ryder? Ryder nodded and attempted the comms again. Sierra 5, this is Fox Tango. I repeat, this is Fox Tango. Do you copy? There was no response. But the static voice of Ryder could be heard echoing in the nearby wreckage. There's a radio in there somewhere. We need to get a closer look. Those cases? Those must be the weapons, yes? Now is our chance. He quickly began to stand, ready to rush the area until he was harshly yanked down by Till. What are you doing? You don't do anything to assure the area is clear. Got it? What a return to glare before looking away in discontent. Okay, Snow, you're of me. Tinsley and Jones, keep an eye out. Ryder? You got eyes on Odor. Make sure he keeps his head down. Odor flashed another salty glare. With their weapons ready, Till gave the command and Snow was the first to bound forward. He quickly reached the cabin, posting up on it. After a second, he gave the clear for Till to move next. He immediately assaulted forward, joining Snow near the cabin. We're clear, Till rendered back to the team. Snow, what you got on the inside? Any signs of the crew? Negative. There's, uh, there's nothing in here. It's completely empty. Till peeked inside for himself. The scene appeared as snow relayed. The cabin was empty, aside from a cluster of dirt and bits of cracked metal. What the hell's going on? Ryder, try the comms for them again. Ryder complied, issuing the same statement from before. From their new angle, they could now hear exactly where the radio signal was being received. The signal was coming from one of the weapon cases next to them. Till slowly reached over to it, unhinging the lock and raising the lid. Immediately, a foul smell forced its presence into the air. The putrid odor caught both of the men off guard. With eyes watering, they forced a look inside, viewing a horrendous sight. Inside, they found the mutilated remains of a man. Holes could be seen plastered throughout his body. At first glance, they appeared to be stab wounds. Yet, on closer inspection, the small chasm seemed to have been a cleaner incision, almost as if they were drilled. It was like finding the fucking special collection of Jeffrey Dahmer. The horror did not end there. The man's genitalia had been removed along with what appeared to be both of his hands. His hair had been clean shaven too, allowing for the clear sight at a twisted face. Even his eyelids were missing showcasing a disturbing glare to match his wide-open mouth, frozen in a scream of terror. Shockingly, there was no trace of blood anywhere in the case. With that level of carnage, the damn thing should have been overfucking flowing filled to the brim with it, at least. Yet, the corpse before them lay empty like a hollow shell. What the fuck is this? Till mouthed, covering his nose with his sleeve. The voice relay from Ryder continued, revealing the radio mic sitting next to the man's head. Jesus, they're all like this, Snow retorted, opening up a second case to the side. What's going on, Sarge? Yeah, what do you see? Till was speechless, painfully eyeing the body with horror. His hairs prickled up the more his eyes traced across the mutilated features. Despite the inflictions, they appeared as if they were conducted in some manner of care. The amputation of his hands, and even his genitalia, did not appear like it was torn by talons or fangs. No. The cuts were clean, almost surgical. This thought sent a subtle shiver through him. This isn't right, Joe. Someone did this and put these men in here. On cue with his words, heavy gunfire suddenly erupted from behind. The tree line directly across from the team. The chopper's metal hull reverberated from the sparks of white crashing into it. Immediately, Till and Snow took cover behind it, 
In response, Tinsley and Ryder returned fire to the opposite tree line. Jones peered through the scope of his rifle to the other side. Sarge, we're looking at heavy forces, about 10 to 12. I don't want to sound drastic, but you gotta get gases out of that ASAP. Thanks, Jones, we'll keep that in mind. Till yelled out against the metallic composition playing in the background. One shot made a quick ricochet past his head. Eagle Eye, we have received heavy enemy fire. I repeat, we are receiving heavy enemy fire. He relayed on the comms. There was no response, only a heavy cry of static. Don't worry, Sarge, we'll clear your path in a minute, Tinsley stated. The giant crouched high and let his machine gun go wild into the tree line. Several opposing figures dropped instantly after being hit from the barrage of bullets. Jones caught sight of one of the soldiers hiding, attempting to aim at Tinsley whilst he was still firing. He made a quick adjustment on the scope of his weapon and eased back on the trigger, dropping the assailant. Woo! One down! He quickly adjusted for another target and fired. Down goes another! Almost clear, Sarge! Tinsley barked, pausing to reload his weapon. The enemy shots seemed to have lightened up. Till took the time to glance back at the enemy tree line to confirm it. He gave a nod at Snow ready to provide cover fire. Yet, a strange rumbling began to occur. The ground began to vibrate. It almost felt like the entire floor was going to collapse. The vibration began to escalate, shaking the air around as well. Till felt his entire body quiver as a low hum eased into the air, growing louder with the trembling. Before he had time to think, a blinding light tore through the sky. The intensity of it forced him to instantly rip his night vision goggles from the blinding blur. From his side, he could tell Snow did the same. At first, he thought it was just a spotlight, a flare maybe. Yet the light was abnormal. It looked different. It felt different. It gave off a pulse like the steady cadence of a heartbeat. The hum from earlier now elevated to a sharp whistling noise, as if something was spun around with immense swiftness. He held his hand up to the sky, hoping to obscure any of its blinding gaze. It was like trying to stare at the sun completely lighting up the night sky. He tore his hand away to try and witness the spectacle in its entirety, inviting all the consequences. He desired to see it. When his eyes made contact, he initially thought he was viewing a star. It gave off the same appearance. It was as if one of the many diamonds above had fallen, gracing them with its presence. As his eyes stared into the light, the sonacy of the world slowly drifted to a calm mute. The effervescence of the light grew in sync, greedily swallowing the world. Nothing else mattered but its fluorescent presence. Now under its radiating spell, Till could see the source of the light was a simple orb. The light rendering from the meager ball of energy was dimming in and out of cadence to its pulse. He was frozen, standing in admiration at the blazing spectacle with a smile forming on his lips. He felt warmness inside, a true feeling of pure euphoria. His arms lightened, allowing his weapon to fall carelessly to the ground. His legs found the means to move without his will and began to carry him forward. As they did, he felt a yearning dwelling inside, a yearning to be blessed more from the beaming comfort. He craved to wholly swath himself in its fervency. He took a step, and levels of happiness grew inside him. With another step, the euphoric levels elevated even more. He anticipated more until he was abruptly tackled to the ground by snow. Immediately, the harsh tones of the world screamed its way back. Bullets ricocheted off the metal wreckage just moments from where he was standing. Joe! Joe! Are you alright? Snow hollered to Till. His voice gradually fought against the dull ringing in Till's ears. Eventually, the ringing did fade. Come on, Joe! Get a hold of yourself! Till's eyes slowly adjusted from the white blindness. His eyes slowly focused until they met with the rigid edges of Snow's face. The first thing to catch his sight was the scar on his cheek, teasing him of yet another moment his ass had been saved. I I'm good, he managed to squeeze out, rubbing his eyes. Sarge, you good over there? Yep, I'm fine, he repeated once more. He glanced over to his team, still holding down cover fire. If you're up to it, Sarge, we got you back. Or not, it's your choice. Take your time, I'm getting my body count. Before he could finish, the orb above shot down a beam of light over to Jones. He immediately froze in mid-sentence. 
The smile from his lips was gone, and his entire face appeared motionless. John stood up calmly. He seemed unaware of anything around him anymore. A few bullets whizzed dangerously close to him, yet he remained frozen in place. Finally, he began walking out, stepping into the open. The entire time, his eyes held a glazed look. Tinsley noted this and attempted to reach his location, but the bullet storm increased their presence around them, forcing him to remain behind cover. Jones, what the hell are you doing? Get behind cover! Jones? Jones, damn it! Snow continued to shout. Till had lost his voice and simply watched in horror. He had an idea of the feeling Jones must have been experiencing from that night. Embodying its warm touch was something truly indescribable. It was a feeling only comprehensible if under the same spell. To be detached from it felt in comparison to detaching one's own arm. It was like parting with the energy that made him feel whole. Jones was now completely in the open. For a second, it appeared to Till as if he had shifted his gaze onto him. It was hard to tell under the brightness of the light, but he thought he caught a slight glimpse of fear in Jones' eyes. It was as if he knew what was coming. Without warning, there was an ear-deafening screech in the air. Several gaping holes exploded in streaks of light over Jones' figure, completely tearing him to shreds. It is them! It is the weapons! Oda's voice bellowed, but it was faint up against the screams of the newly introduced menace. Abazame shook his head in fear in the reminiscence of his early encounter and took off into the darkness. The notion surprised Odo. Where are you going? Get back here now! You coward! Till was still in daze and lying without strength. He was ready to close his eyes and drift off until he felt his body being torn from the ground. Let's go! Move your ass, Joe! Pushing him forward, the two of them scrambled from the wreckage, no longer adhering to the rules of bounding. With these newfound weapons, it did not matter anymore. Streaks of screaming light continued to whiz past their heads like the wrath of a cloudburst. Thunderous crashes echoed into the air when the attacks met with trees and a spark of fire. With the tree line a few feet away, Snow shoved Till forward while leaping into cover. Tinsley managed to run over to the two, dodging two oncoming blasts. Sarge, we need to get the hell away from here now! Till was still a bit incoherent. Before words could leave his lips, the beaming orb sent down another ray, this time subjecting Ryder. Ryder! Snow and Tinsley spun around from his cries to meet the horror. Ryder stood up in the same manner as Jones, but instead of the blank stare, his face twisted into fear. He began screaming out loud, no longer afraid, but in horrifying pain. He threw his head up against a tree, repeating the action over and over again. Even through the chaos around, they could still make out the sickening cracking being produced. After a moment of shock, Tinsley and Snow rushed to subdue him, but the light enveloping Ryder was like a hot cloak, burning their skin upon touch. Ryder continued to bellow out in pain, his vocal cords began to crack from the intensity. Tinsley could not take it anymore, and made another attempt to subdue him, embodying the pain of the light. He managed to bear hug Ryder's feeble form. His skin began to singe, form large boils, burning away bits of flesh. Regardless, Tinsley held on tight. Even so, Ryder fought back with a strength unlike his own in the giant's arms. Ryder's pain-driven cry sounded inhuman. Abruptly, he managed to slip free. Before anyone could react, he reached for his weapon on the ground, aimed it to his mouth and pulled the trigger. A loud pop went off, and the lifeless form of Ryder fell to the ground. There was no time for them to mourn. The light quickly retracted from Ryder's body, reforming itself. It now took on an appearance resembling a ghostly hand. Without hesitation, the blight promptly slithered towards Odo like a snake. Till made an attempt to push Odo away, but the light quickly expanded, swallowing them both. His skin was subjected to the burning grip of the beaming spectacle. The experience was different from before. The sweet euphoria that melted his heart earlier, beyond measure, was not present this time. Instead, there was an excruciating pain like a fire was searing his face and arms. He could literally feel his skin being singed off his bones. In response, his mouth opened to scream out in agony, but his voice was absent, stolen from him. Instead, he felt his lungs consumed by a fiery blaze of heated needles jabbing at all angles. 
He could feel his eyes starting to roll back against his will. From there, a rapid image appeared in his mind and then dissipated. It was too quick to comprehend, but then it appeared again. Then again for another second, but he was able to see it this time. More flashes came after, each slowly meshing together, providing a full distorted picture. He found himself kneeling in a chamber, glowing in a familiar bleachy color he grew to loathe. He was not alone, though. He was surrounded by strange figures. Their forms were dark and obscured by the light, almost teasing an illusion of their presence. But they were there indeed. Although their faces were empty, he could feel their unseen gazes upon him. It was like they were glaring at him, detesting him. It was like their raw emotions had taken form. He could literally feel the embodiment of their hate, feeling like talons slowly dragging across his skin. Although no words were spoken by the beings, he could perceive their thoughts within his own. They were reeling his mind with images. He was subjected to horrendous sights. He saw people, many screaming frantically and in agony as metallic instruments penetrated or carved without mercy into their flesh. He saw images of Somalian officials in suits gazing into their own spectacle of lights from the orbs above. There were images of soldiers attacking villages, some transporting children and women into the warehouses. Another set revealed a strange metallic case opening up in a claw-like manner. Inside were stacks of oddly shaped armaments being taken by soldiers. The images escalated in rate. All the while, the illumination around grew brighter, consuming everything. Till had lost notion of anything else around. He could feel his very essence reeling from his form. What was to become of him? Would he now only exist in a vast pool of nothingness? An imprisonment orchestrated by his bright tormentors until his very form ceased to exist? He did not know. Regardless, he was powerless. Unexpectedly, the white blindness was torn from around him as his sight reverted back to the dark jungles. He found himself on the ground with an arm gripping his shoulder. Upon rendering a confused gaze, he recognized its owner to be Tinsley. The rest of Tinsley was laying over an unconscious odor. The way that they were on the ground suggested he must have tackled them and somehow the notion was enough to release them. The perpetrating ray of light made a snake-like retract upward until it faded with the orb. At that moment, Till felt a fire erupt within him. He immediately rolled to the side and began vomiting uncontrollably. The notion brought a minor relief. Afterwards, he began to feel a pain surging across his face and arms. It felt as if he'd been shoved into an oven and roasted alive. Joe, are you alright? Snow asked, running up to him. Till felt very weak. His eyes shifted over to the grinning face of Tinsley. Sorry, Sarge. But I couldn't let them take you too. Till returned a feeble smile back, but their celebration was cut short due to the enemy soldiers still firing around the area. The numbers appeared to have increased, and they began to push forward now that their aerial support had abandoned them. Till could barely stand after Snow helped him off the ground. We are leaving now! What about him? Tinsley gestured to the unconscious Odor. Is he alive? Tinsley gave a pulse check. Yeah, unfortunately. Then bring him. We don't leave anyone behind. Tinsley picked up the man, slinging him over his shoulder. Immediately after, they retreated from the site. Their pursuers remained vigilant, tailing them and firing blindly. Till passed out a few times along the way, until eventually blacking out for good. When Till slowly opened his eyes, he found himself lying in a bed. The steady rhythm of a beep was lingering in the background. His eyes traced around the room. It was fairly small, showcasing only a single chair. The walls and even the ceiling was a bland white color. White, he thought. Why did it have to be fucking white? He noticed his arms had been heavily bandaged. The tight constriction around his face gave the assumption that it too was in the same predicament. 
the door to the room opened, revealing a middle-aged man with thin spectacles and neatly combed hair. He was sporting a white lab coat and held a clipboard in his hand. Good afternoon, Sergeant Till, he said with a warm smile. Afternoon. It's the middle of the night. Indeed it was when they brought you in. You slept most into the next day. Today, that is. The man replied, checking the clipboard at the end of the bed. He began jotting notes onto it. Where am I? Who are you? He attempted to sit up, but was met with a sharp pain that seemed to pulse everywhere without a clear origin. He shouldn't move. Here, try this. He pulled a remote from his pocket and clicked the button. In response, the bed's higher portion began to rise. About a quarter way up, it halted. I'm Dr. Keller, and you're safe. We're at McCarthy Eisenhower Base. Safe, Till thought. Immediately his mind sparked with worry. Where's Snow and Tinsley? The doctor held up a hand. Relax. They're here as well, recovering just the same. He gave a sigh of relief. What happened? How do we get here? At that moment, the door opened again. This time entering was a man fully dressed in uniform. The man wore a sharp suit, crisp in the edges. His chest was decorated with ribbons and medals that met to his shoulder. The shoulders themselves had three golden stars across them. He had silky grey hair neatly combed to the side. His beady eyes almost sunk within his wrinkling face. They lightened up as he drew closer. Till recognized the man. General Irons, afternoon, sir, he said, issuing a weak salute. As you were, son. Sergeant Till, I understand you and your men went through quite an ordeal out there. I'm glad you were able to return to us safely. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry to say that the mission was a failure. Don't worry about it. There will be plenty of missions in the future. Right now, I think it's important you get your rest. His face held a false wrinkle smile. If you don't mind me asking, sir, what happened out there? Why, well, your men, SSG Snow and SSG Tinsley, was it? They were able to haul you over to a neighboring canyon village. The villagers hid you there until it was possible to call in a medevac. Came as soon as we could. What about Odor? Who? The general inquired with a confused face. There was an unconscious Somalian in our company. He was helping us. Oh, the general replied, rendering a quizzing glance at the doctor. Yes, the Somalian, I'm afraid he didn't make it. He suffered from massive third-degree burns and severe cerebral trauma. He died an hour after bringing him here. I'm sorry. Yes, that's very tragic. I understand that along with the Sierra 5 team that we lost two fine soldiers from your team as well. Till felt his eyes fall to the bed. He was hoping that deaths had been part of some twisted nightmare. That they were all right and recovering in another room like the others. Well, I'll let you rest now, the general said, heading towards the duel. There's just one more thing, sir. He halted, returning a subtle face of irritation. What happened out there? The elderly eyes of the man squinted hard. I just told you what happened. What's the confusion, Sergeant? Not about that, sir. I'm in. We saw something out there. Something unnatural. Whatever it was, it did something to me. To all of us. And the weapons we saw. They... They weren't of this world. The general's eyes lit softly before easing into an annoyed look. Son, I think you should really rest up now. No, sir, I've rested enough. Our intel was wrong. The extremists aren't the enemies. The Somalian government is. They're somehow in league with some some unknown beings, not, not of this world. I don't know. Look, I know how this sounds. But you have to believe me, sir. Sergeant First Class Till, do you have any idea how idiotic you sound right now? The general replied, his eyes seemed to conjoin with the words both cutting deep without remorse. Would you believe you? I'm going to pretend these crazy accusations are in response to your medication. 
Hell, you should be more concerned with your condition, son. Then, his words abruptly fell flat when he noticed the confusion upon Till's face. You're aware of your condition, right? You didn't tell him yet? He shot at the doctor, startling him. I, I was going to, General, just before you arrived. Tell me what? Till asked, feeling an eerie chill fall down his spine. The doctor cleared his throat before answering. I'm sorry, Sergeant, but you have cancer. Till stared blankly at the man for a moment. I have what? His eyes remained fixated on the doctor's. Cancer, Sergeant. Terminal, I'm afraid. I have cancer. Yes. In fact, you all do. Although SSG Snow and SSG Tinsley don't have it as bad as you. I'm afraid you all have skin, lung, and a large mass in your frontal lobe. Not to mention you've suffered from two degree burns covering almost 75% of your body. The doctor's words seemed to fade into a dull ringing, welcoming a soft numbing in his head. Till slowly let his head fall back onto the pillow, closing his eyes. The word cancer lingered in his mind, echoing like a void cavern. An unwavering chill began to envelop his body, gradually consuming his form with every second passing. Sergeant? Sergeant? The voice tore Till away from his trance. He immediately opened his eyes, now filled with a fire. The sorrow was draining from him. In its place, something else was slowly brewing. Anger. How long? He started softly. He bit his lip, rendering a deep breath before continuing. How long do I have? I'm afraid I don't know. Could be months, could be weeks. We'll need your permission, but with it, we can start the chemotherapy now and hope for the best. Hope for the best. That was his fucking response. Those words sounded so fucking empty. So that was it. After everything he'd been through, after all the missions, all the encounters where he barely avoided the icy clutches of death, she would have him now. Of all things, fucking cancer. Till turned his face to the general again, but it was gone. The bastard managed to squeeze out without another word, no fucking surprise though. When Till mentioned the beings and the weapons, he recalled the expression of the general. It was the subtle expression Oda had been given before. He wasn't fooling anyone. The fucker knew what was going on. The amount he knew, and for how long, was undetermined. There was also the words he spoke earlier. There will be plenty of missions in the future. He said them without a second thought, like dismissing a broken cup knowing there's another one to replace it. How many lives did it take before he became numb to it all? Out there, a foreign nation was offering their people to be experimented upon in exchange for advanced technology. The American government, whether they were involved or not, caught wind of this trade-off. They opted to gain these weapons and God knows what else for themselves. No surprise for the good old U.S. of fucking A. We never did like to concede to a second place. To being outclassed. Till and his men were mere pawns in a bigger, unseen game. His team was not the first to be used in this game. And they certainly would not be the last. There would be plenty of hot shots. Plenty of fresh bodies to fill their place all willing to do their job without asking questions.